and live streamed. We've decided to hold this meeting online, obviously due to the increasing numbers of recent COVID cases and to reduce the risk to the community. I'm Lydia Wilson, Chair of Council, and I'd also like to introduce my administrator colleagues, Ms. Peter Duncan. Everybody. And Mr. Chris Eddy. Good evening, all. And I'd also like to introduce our Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Craig Lloyd, and ask that he in turn introduce members of the executive leadership team in attendance this evening. Good evening, Chair. Good evening, Administrators. Uh, so I'd like to welcome our Director of Community Wellbeing, Ms. Kate McCacky. Our Director of Planning and Development, Mr. Justin O'Mara. Our Director of Customer and Corporate Services, Ms. Sarah Renner, and welcoming Sarah to her first meeting with us this evening. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Our Director of Infrastructure and Environment, Ms. Debbie Wood. And our Executive Manager, Governance and Strategy, Mr. Frank Joyce. Good evening, all. Almighty God, we ask for your blessing upon this council to make informed and good decisions to benefit the people of the city of Whittlesea. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lloyd. And can I also take the opportunity to welcome Ms. Renner to her first council meeting? Uh, before we start, on behalf of the City of Whittlesea, I recognise the rich Aboriginal heritage of this country and acknowledge the Wurundjeri Willem clan as the traditional owners of this place. And I'd also like to pay my personal respect to elders past, present and emerging. I note that all administrators are present. Administrators, if you have a conflict of interest in any item on the notice paper, you may verbally disclose the type and nature of the interest now, but you must make a declaration immediately before consideration of the matter in question. Are there any items for which you have a conflict of interest to declare? No, Chair. N nor from me. Thank you, Chair. And I also have no conflict of interest to declare. Uh, I seek a motion to confirm the minutes of the following preceding meeting, which was the scheduled meeting of Council held on the 27th of June 2022. Could I please have a mover and a seconder? Yes, Chair. Happy to move that. Second. Thank you, Ms Duncan. Thank you, Administrator Eddie. I'll now put the matter to a vote. All those in favour of confirming the minutes, the motion is carried. Uh, we are about to move into public question time and I would just like to make a few guiding comments uh, in relation to public question time, which are in fact embedded in our governance rules. Uh, council allows up to 30 minutes each meeting for members of the public to ask up to two questions and have their query responded to. The person may ask their questions or talk to their joint letter or petition for up to two minutes in total. Uh, and, in, and this evening I'm going to be asking Mr Joyce to please advise everyone uh, when the two minute time is up. Uh, all questions and answers must be as brief as possible and obviously asked respectfully. Where members of the public do not wish to speak to the matter, the submitted question, petition or joint letter will either be read out by the CEO, by myself or a delegate, and I will either respond to the question or nominate an administrator or the CEO to respond. And obviously the questions and responses will all be recorded in the minutes of the meeting. When invited to ask their question, the person must state their name, suburb and any organisation or group they represent prior to asking the question to council. Please note that after asking a question, there's also no discussion allowed 
other than for the purpose of clarification. Uh, I note that this evening we have three public questions tonight from two residents, as well as a resident speaking to a submission and another resident speaking to a joint letter. Uh, and I do need to note that, that it's really great to have such strong community representation at tonight's meeting. And it's unfortunate that we couldn't be in person to interact directly and meet our residents. Firstly, we have two public questions from Thomas Watkins of Laylor, and uh, he is available online to ask his questions. That's correct, Mr. Joyce. I yes, just see I Mr. Watkins Mr. connecting Watkins. now to audio. Uh, Mr. Watkins, could you please first state your name, suburb, and any organisation or group you represent before asking the questions? Uh, and I'll be asking Mr. Lloyd to respond to your questions after you've asked both of them. Mr. Joyce, do we have a slight it, technical issue? Yes, it appears that uh, Mr. Watkins was there. He just seems to have disappeared. Yes, I noted that he was there and he was trying to connect to audio. <clears throat> we might need to see if he can be re-let in. It looks like he's, a, he's connecting again. Yes. Good evening, Mr. Watkins. I'm not sure if he seems to have a problem Sorry. connecting to. Good evening, can Mr. Watkins. Are you there? Hey, yeah, can you hear me okay? Can hear you now. And I just wonder, I'll oh, thank you if you wouldn't mind turning your camera. Thank you very sure, much. Sure, no problem. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Watkins, you. did you hear my earlier comments just about the fact that I was going to get you to ask your two questions? And then I would ask Mr. Lloyd to respond to the two questions. Yeah, so did you say state my name and address first? Is that what I heard? Yes, please. Sure. Uh, Your thanks. name, suburb, and organisation or group you represent, if you could. Fantastic. Thanks, Lydia. Uh, my name is Thomas Watkins. Uh, I live at Fort A. Anderson Street in Laylor. I'm not representing any groups at the moment. Um, do I... Just proceed. Do you want me to ask both first or the one? And then yes, answer? if you could. If you could ask your two questions and then I'll get Mr. Lloyd to respond to the two of them. Okay. So the first question. Uh, over the past 12 months, I've submitted nine complaints to council via both Snap, Send, Sol and email regarding litter issues at parks in the local government area. Littering and rubbish issues are only getting worse. What is council doing to address litter at our parks and why do I have to continually make complaints with no response or action? The second question, I've written to council many times and previously asked a question at council, at a council meeting regarding extensive litter issues after Mill Park Soccer Club events at Partridge Street Reserve in Laylor. Only time council has done anything about this is when I contacted a local member of parliament. Why do residents have to get in touch with local members of parliament before council takes their concerns seriously? Thank you very much, Mr. Watkins. But before I hand over to Mr. Lloyd to respond to your questions, I'm just going to ask my colleagues whether they have any questions or require any points of clarification from you. No, sure. no. And I, I too, I think your questions are quite self-explanatory. Thank you. So I will hand over to Mr. Lloyd now to respond to the two questions in turn. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good evening, Mr. Watkins. Um, in response, uh, dumped rubbish and litter is part of a wider community issue that Council is trying to address right across the municipality. Council has recently introduced a new litter enforcement team. They've only been with us a couple of weeks now, and they will be working with the community to identify litter hotspots and use a range of methods, including the use of cameras to investigate and track where rubbish has come from. Reporting of dump rubbish can be made via our website or by calling the council main number. People caught dumping rubbish face fines of up to $1,817 for individuals and $9,087 for companies. We're also working with local sporting clubs, reminding them of their responsibility to ensure their members and guests keep the sites clean and litter free following matches and training. 
In addition, we're developing an overall bin policy to review rubbish and recycling bins in all of our parks and open spaces, as well as considering the upsizing of some of our smaller bins. In regards to your question about contacting council, we do take these customer inquiries seriously, and I'm certainly happy to follow up this particular issue uh, with you to make sure that you receive a response. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lloyd, um, and thank you very much, Mr. Watkins, for uh, coming along, albeit virtually, this evening, and we hope that we can meet you in person at a forthcoming council meeting. Uh, thank you very much for your questions, and obviously you're free to leave the meeting now. Sure. Can I, can I just follow up on that um, point regarding the litter enforcement team? Mr. Watkins, could I just say, as per the governance rules, unfortunately, there's no opportunity for the follow up after public question time. Um, I think I understand that you want some further information. You will be That's getting correct. a written response. And uh, I think, Mr. Mr. Lloyd, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'm, I'm happy after this meeting to make sure that the relevant director um, Ms. Wood uh, makes contact with Mr. Watkins to deal with this very particular issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Watkins. Again, you'll get a, the written responses to your questions. And uh, as Mr. Lloyd indicated, Ms. Wood will be back in touch with you. Thanks again for attending this evening. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we've also this evening received a question from Mr. Nick Brain of Epping, who's not present tonight. Uh, and so I will read his question out on his behalf uh, and quote, council has no plans to build a community sporting facility or public library of any scale in the Epping North Willert area for nearly a decade. First dot point, second dot point, done no work to understand how residents without access to private transport could utilise the proposed Mernda mega project. How long does council expect local residents and ratepayers in Epping North will alert to put up with being deprived of vital community facilities whilst cross subsidising infrastructure plans that do not practically factor in their needs? And that's the end of the question. Uh, again, Mr. Lloyd, if I could ask you to provide a response to Mr. Brain's question. Yes, thank you, Chair, and I apologise in advance. It's a, a fairly lengthy uh, response. Council is very aware of the challenges of building timely community infrastructure right across our municipality. Ensuring Council is able to continue to deliver on its Capital Works programme for all areas in the City of Whittlesea has been a major driver of the recommendation to stage the delivery of the regional sports and aquatic facility at Mernda in the report being presented for Council's consideration this evening. Council is currently developing its long-term community infrastructure strategy to ensure we have a pipeline of community infrastructure projects ready to deliver over the next 20 years. The strategy will be underpinned by several principles, including projects being equitable across Council's established growth and rural areas. We'll review the timing of some of the community infrastructure as we develop the strategy and adjust it where it is required and where it's feasible within Council's budget. As discussed at a meeting with Mr Brain and officers in July this year, disjointed land development and therefore access to land identified for community, community facilities is a challenge in the Epping North Willer East Corridor and will impact the timing of delivery. Planning and feasibility for several key community and recreation facilities are scheduled to commence in the next five years, including the Epping North Library, a new community centre east of Epping Road, and an AFL tennis cricket facility in Edgars Creek. In addition, the replacement of tennis court surfaces at Epping Recreation Reserve is scheduled for 2025, and the Epping Central Information and Learning Hub feasibility study will be undertaken in 2029. Council welcomes the opportunity for ongoing discussion on these issues as we progress the long-term community strategy over the next 12 months. With regards to the transport options, Council regularly meets with the Victorian Government's Department of Transport to advocate for improvements to bus services within our municipality, especially in the growth corridor areas. Council will continue to partner this partnership to ensure best outcomes for our community, including reviewing whether additional <laughs> services will be required to improve access to the regional sports and aquatic facility from the Epping Willer area. 
Currently, there is one service route that runs between Craigieburn Station and Mernda Station. A fully connected shared path network from Mernda Station to the Mernda Regional Aquatic Centre will be completed as part of the Bridge in Road duplication and Everton Drive Plenty Road intersection projects, allowing for active travel. Once Everton Drive Plenty Road intersection is completed, it would also provide an opportunity for Council to advocate for bus services along Everton Drive, providing direct connection to the regional sports facility in Miranda. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr Lloyd, and thank you very much for that really comprehensive response. I'm sure that Mr Brain will appreciate the level of detail in that response. Uh, and I also just need to note that I'm very glad that the meeting occurred between council officers and Mr Brain in person because that was something that came out of his submission to the draft budget. So thank you very much for that. Uh, if we move on now to public submissions, this next matter is in relation to an item on the council agenda this evening, item 5.2.2, Bintz Road Discontinuance Harvest Home Road to Lehmans Road. Uh, at its meeting on the 8th of November 2021, council resolved to commence a formal consultation for the permanent discontinuance of Bintz Road between Harvest Home Road and Lehmans Road in Willert in accordance with section 12 of the Road Management Act 2004. And during the consultation period that was carried out between November 2021 and April 2022, council received three written submissions from the community, two in favour and one against. And we have with us this evening online, Ms. Doretta Bellot, who would like to speak to her submission. Uh, and um, Mr. Joyce, I can't, oh yes, I think, uh, I think she, she's, just logging in she's now. now connecting to audio. Ms. Bellot, I um, now invite you when you are ready to speak to your submission. She's just trying to connect to audio again. Good evening, Ms. Bello. Hi, Mrs. Bello. Good evening. And I just wonder whether you would mind turning on your camera. Uh, how do I do that? Hang on a tick. <laughs> Sorry. No problems at all. Is that right? No, we can't still see you. We can hear you. Oh, here we go. You can see yes. me now. Fantastic. You Thank you finger. very much. <laughs> uh, please, um, if I could invite you to speak to your submission. All oh, right. Well, my husband and I, we live in the corner of Lehman's and Bents Road. Um, we're, we're saying, could we close Bents Road totally? Mm -hmm. um, or if you're going to leave our end open, the north end, um, dust is a big issue. Mm -hmm. um, and the maintaining of that road, how are you going to accomplish that? And also there's a single lane bridge and a rise in a, a single lane rise in the road. Are you going to update the road or if you're going to leave that end open? My thought is what I, what's worrying me is when you're updating High Street, Epping Road, a lot of traffic already come this way anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what's going to happen when you're doing a lot of road work up there, they're going to come this way. I mean, if there's an accident on Epping Road, the traffic is horrific, of course, for hours until it's cleared. Now, the other thing is, why wouldn't you keep the south end of Bintz Road open? Because people go th right through the housing estate. That's how they get um, from... Um, Ahern's, what, no, it's not Ahern's Road. Finden Road to Lehman's Road is through the housing estate. So 
I mean, they're things that have got to be considered. Because the dust, like, if there's a car accident, and I've taken photos of the amount of dust that is flying in the air, and, and people have got their headlights on to go along the road because they can't see. Okay. And it goes onto our roof and into our water tanks. And we're still on tank water. Yeah. That's a major issue. That's a major issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Lot. Um, to, to the chair, just to advise, we've just had the two minutes. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming along this evening. Uh, as you would be aware, we will be considering uh, public submissions in relation to this matter later in the meeting. Uh, it's item 5.2.2 on the agenda. So you're free to leave the meeting, but we'd really encourage you to view the live stream for the outcome of this particular matter when we consider it later on. And you will also be mm -hmm. receiving a written submission, uh, a written response in relation to the outcome of the matter. So thank you okay. very much again for attending and putting forward your perspectives on this important issue. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, so we uh, also have a joint letter this evening and the joint letter is from Mr. El Zanati. Uh, and I understand that he is also going to be in attendance this evening online. Is that correct, Mr. Joyce? Yes, I understand he is being let in at the moment. And the joint letter is requesting the removal of street trees in University Hill Estate, Bandura. And uh, Mr. El Zanati is the lead signatory of that joint letter and hopefully will be with us very shortly to speak to the joint letter. I think it may uh, is, be listed yes. as Michael. Michael. And he's just connecting to audio. Good evening, Mr. Elzanati. Good evening, Mr. Elzanati. Oh, he's, he's still trying to connect. We might need to just give another minute for all the technical aspects. Um, he's trying to connect still. I think, uh, Mr. Lloyd. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, if Mr. Alzanati isn't able to join, um, can I suggest that we continue to um, move with the matter and invite him to the next meeting, given it will take us some time to put together a response on this? Um, we might, we'll be able to organise something uh, for his connection for next time, if that is the problem. Yes, thank you, Mr. Lloyd. Uh, I can see that he is still attempting to connect to audio, but. Uh, unfortunately, we do have um, limited time this evening. So, uh, Mr. Lloyd, are you proposing that we don't resolve at all on this matter, but we simply... Um, no, Chair, I'm, invite... I'm suggesting that you resolve on the matter, but whilst, whilst it's under consideration with officers, uh, we can invite Mr. Altanati to the next meeting to speak to it, because it will still be under consideration at that point. All right. Uh, I think we might go down that path, unfortunately, because I don't think uh, Mr. Elzanati is having any luck connecting to audio this evening. So could I then perhaps propose um, that we move to resolve that council receive the joint letter, because we already have that joint letter, uh, and that a final report be presented to council at its meeting on the 17th of October, 2022. Uh, and we will obviously be in touch with Mr. Elzanati in the meantime. 
do I have a seconder? Seconded. Thank you, Administrator Eddie. Uh, I'll now put the matter to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Thank you. So if we now move into general business, uh, administrators, we're going to now work through the agenda, which is a very long and uh, we have some very important matters for deliberation this evening. Uh, and the first item is 5.1.1, Aboriginal Gathering Place Business Case. And if I could invite our Director of Community Wellbeing, Ms. Kate <coughs> McCackie, to provide an introduction to this item. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's, officers are very pleased to be presenting the Aboriginal Gathering Place final business case report tonight. This is another really important chapter in this project. Um, sorry, my computer's just frozen. Um, so it's part of a, um, it's not only is an important uh, project for the municipality, but it's also, there's some really important broader context as well with both the Victorian treaty process underway and the Commonwealth Government's voice to parliament referendum planned. So it's an, um, it's an important time to come together and learn about and celebrate and reflect upon our shared histories. And in line with Council's stretch reconciliation action plan, if we can do this well, we will emerge as a stronger, healthier, more understanding and more connected community. Um, and at the grassroots level, we believe that the gathering place will play an important role in fostering this. Um, we'd also like to just acknowledge um, the important contribution and partnership of the Woodlesey Aboriginal Gathering Place Advisory Group that's worked with us on the development of this final business case um, and also recognise the Whittlesey Reconciliation Group's contribution to keeping the, the idea of a gathering place going over many, many years. Um, I'd like to thank our staff, led by Tony Mason, Manager of Aboriginal Communities, and the many officers across our organisation from our Aboriginal Aboriginal Communities Team, Capital Delivery, Strategic Projects, um, and many others who've worked hard to bring this report before Council. I'd now like to introduce Tony Mason, Manager of Aboriginal Communities, who will run through the key elements of the uh, final business case and, the, um, and also will work, walk us through some of the key recommendations. Uh, I'd like to introduce Thank Tony Mason. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McCackie, and also welcome, Ms. Mason. Thank you, Kate, and thank you, Chair. I would like to begin with acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on today. I am on the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge the 20 years of advocacy by our local Aboriginal residents for an Aboriginal gathering place, largely through the Whittlesea Reconciliation Group and now through the Whittlesea Aboriginal Gathering Place Advisory Group. Aboriginal gathering places are community hubs, which are welcoming and safe spaces for our Aboriginal community members, but gathering places uh, also engage non-Aboriginal community members to increase their knowledge of Aboriginal culture through activities and also training programs. Each gathering place is unique and is developed in response to the local Aboriginal communities determining what programs and services they need delivered from their gathering place. The final business case for Whittlesea's gathering place provides option two within the report, which includes scope of a large multi-purpose space, which can be used for gatherings, training or events, multi-purpose uh, or meeting room, a healing or quiet room, consultation rooms, a kitchen, terrace, landscaping that provides external gathering spaces, as well as car parking. Working with the Aboriginal Gathering Place Advisory Group, the business case has identified that these spaces can deliver a diverse suite of cultural, health, wellbeing, environmental, education and community development programs. Additionally, the City of Whittlesea has closely worked with the advisory group to support self-determination, which includes a phased approach towards governance of the facility by the community aim of being an Aboriginal community controlled entity over the next three years, at which point the Aboriginal community controlled entity will resume operations of the gathering place. As an interim phase, Council's Aboriginal community department will develop and deliver Aboriginal programs for local community of all ages in collaboration with this phased approach is being delivered in Council facilities is complete 
gathering place facility. There are operational costs associated with developing and delivering Aboriginal programs, which includes delivering uh, programs within the existing council facilities from 2023. These are programs that will engage young people, health promotion events, play groups, and cultural awareness programs. The recommendations are as read and in summary include gratefully acknowledging the leadership, knowledge, and contribution of the Whittlesea Gath Aboriginal Gathering Place Advisory Group in developing the final Aboriginal Gathering Place business case. In terms of the facility, it is proposed that council endorses option two, the foundational facility in the business case and an advocacy position that requires construction commencement being subject to a $5 million co-contribution from either state or federal government. Notes that the Aboriginal Gathering Place governance transition will be community-led and subject to change as the project evolves and will be informed by the Victorian government's treaty process that is underway. Finally, the long-term capital and operational costs noted in Table 6 of this report are between 2021-22 and 2027-28 financial years. Thank, thank you very much, Ms Mason. Had you concluded your um, overview of the report and recommendations? Yes, I have. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Administrators, do you have any questions relating to this item? Uh, yes, Chair, I do. So through the Chair, the report details that there's no um, Aboriginal gathering place of this scale or scope in the north. So I'm wondering if you could briefly talk about the potential catchment population in the north of those who identify as Aboriginal? Yes, so we, we have talked to, I guess, uh, just our local population within the city of Whittlesea, but largely there are uh, other catchment areas uh, around Whittlesea. So if we're looking at the Northern Metropolitan Council's region, that includes Whittlesea, Hume, Nilambic, Banyul, Darabin and Mourne councils. And the total Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population of these councils combined is 7,913 people from the 2021 uh, census. So that's um, a growing population uh, of which the city of Whittlesea makes up nearly 30%. Right, thank you. I've got nothing further, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Duncan. Um, thank you for clarifying that point, Ms. Mason, because I had the similar query because I would have presumed, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the broader catchment of the north, the 7,913 the, our Aboriginal gathering place would in fact be available for that broader catchment. Yes, so Aboriginal gathering places uh, work in a similar way to Aboriginal community controlled organisations in that mm. uh, they're not limited to providing service only in the region in which they operate. So there are many services, many community members that would access uh, various services um, in different locations um, and that's about accessing the right service uh, yeah. for that person that individual or the family group um, so that is required mm. so it's not thank unusual you. for community to work that way thank you uh, miss mason and just to follow up if i could um could you just outline how many aboriginal specific or aboriginal controlled organizations there are in Whittlesea and or the broader northern region? Yeah, so we have five Aboriginal community controlled organisations in the city of Whittlesea. So we, the council um, and the Aboriginal Communities Department uh, does work closely with um, these community organisations uh, and then more broadly within the northern metropolitan region, there are 12 Aboriginal community controlled organisations many of which are actually statewide services um, that provide mm. multiple services across the state um, from satellite sites as well. Thank you very much. Um, do either of the administrators have any further, Mr Eddy? Uh, thank you, Chair. Ms Mason, I noticed in the recommendation that um, 
we're talking about the transition of the government's governance model being subject subject to change as the project evolves. And there's a comment about uh, being informed by the Victorian government's treaty process. I wonder whether you could say a little bit more about how you think this process might be informed by the treaty process, or is that a how long is a piece of string question? Um, potentially, but also our Whittlesea Aboriginal Gathering Place Advisory Group um, includes members of the traditional owner group. So we are also, that group is also mindful of the role of traditional owner groups uh, with regards to treaty processes and these types of um, facilities and uh, decisions being made across different areas um, in our local government area. So that's just something that we need to be mindful of, um, as is the advisory group. So in, in talking about the transition being subject to change also indicates that the intention is for the uh, advisory group to become an Aboriginal community controlled entity uh, within three years. But if, um, if something comes up, uh, if something happens similar to a, a pandemic type situation or, or something that is out of the group's control, then we would support um, the group to transition at a time that is um, that they're able to achieve that transition in, which is explained in the business case where we are continuing to work with the, um, the governance group. Thank you, Ms. Mason. Uh, any further questions, administrators? No? no. Uh, could I then seek a mover for the officer recommendation for item 5.1.1? Chair, yeah, I'd be delighted to move the officer recommendations for this item, 5.1.1, with two slide recommendations. And I think they're coming up on the screen now, which is 2A and 4 as follows. And 2A is uh, to have option two, foundational facility, and add in approximately of approximately um, 650 meters. And I'd like that included in there. And um, I'd like to add that it, uh, it reads, endorses an advocacy position that a partnership with the state and or federal government is a prerequisite for the Aboriginal gathering place and will be dependent on a $5 million government co-contribution uh, towards the construction of the facility. That's it, Chair. Thank Thank you, Ms. Duncan, and I'm very happy to second this item with those um, adjustments to the recommendations. Uh, so as the mover, Ms. Duncan, would you like to speak to this item? Uh, yes, please, Chair, just uh, briefly. Um, I really would just like to gratefully acknowledge the leadership, knowledge and con contribution of the Wilsey Aboriginal Gathering Place Advisory Group. Um, they have been instrumental in this process and in developing the final Aboriginal Gathering Place business case and also the advice and support from um, Aboriginal Victoria and the traditional owners. So I would like to thank them. And as we've talked about, this will be the only gathering place of this size and scale in the broader northern uh, metropolitan region. And it's really important we acknowledge the uh, sustained advocacy and it seems different to call it sustained, but the sustained advocacy by the WIG for nearly 20 years. So a thank you to the WIG as well um, for keeping keeping on keeping on to get this to a business case stage. So congratulations and thank you to all of the officers and staff at council who have been instrumental in pulling this all together. So well done to everybody. Uh, thank you, Ms. Duncan. If I could also make a few uh, comments about this really important item uh, and acknowledge also the extensive previous work and deliberations um, and the um, wonderful uh, work that has occurred in the development of the draft business case uh, previously. We've had multiple briefings by council officers, and I think it's important to note as administrators that we really need to do our own due diligence in relation to critical decisions that need to be made, such as this one. 
Ms Mason indicated that, in fact, um, the Aboriginal gathering place at Whittlesea has been an aspiration of community members for over 20 years. And, in fact, this matter has been formally considered by the previous council and by the current council, and it goes back to 2018. And I think it's really good that there's a chronology of decisions that have been appended to the report. This is a major initiative for delivery, which is within our community plan 2021-25. It's also, uh, as has been indicated, and it's within the uh, recommendations, it's a major advocacy priority for council to secure government funding. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge the really uh, rigorous engagement process that has occurred over some time, uh, and it's well documented in the report in relation to the multiple opportunities for community comment and input uh, through the feasibility study, a, a range of workshops and uh, individual meetings. And Ms Mason clearly noted the uh, wonderful work that's happened by the Whittlesea um, Reconciliation Group, and Ms Duncan is a member of that group, and I previously have also been a member, but also the Whittlesea Aboriginal Gathering Place Advisory Committee. Uh, so I really acknowledge the amount of work that's gone into consulting, but also working with a range of key government departments and agencies, and again, they're very, it's well documented within the council report. Ms Mason made the very clear point that the Aboriginal gathering place is a place for both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. And she clarified um, the issue in relation to the potential broader catchment beyond Whittlesea municipal boundaries. Uh, and it's well highlighted within the report that there are many potential benefits, whether it's education, employment, cultural awareness, increased trust and, and obviously partnerships and networks. Uh, and I do want to also note that um, there is a wonderful location for the gathering place at Quarry Hills uh, Regional Parkland. Just in concluding... Um, excuse me, um, Chair. I just need to advise, just hit the three minute mark. Thank so you, continue, thank you. I will, thank you, Mr. Joyce. Yeah. I will be at 20 seconds. In concluding, it's a really responsible financial approach, I believe, to have a co-contribution with the state and or federal government. And can I thank all the, um, the Whittlesea Reconciliation Group and the Aboriginal Gathering Place Advisory Committee, but also, also acknowledge the huge amount of work of our staff. Congratulations to everyone. Sorry about going over time, Mr Joyce, and thank you for reminding me of those requirements. Uh, Mr Eddie, do you have any further comments you'd like to make? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I would like to. Uh, this uh, project was one of the first I heard about when I arrived here uh, last year uh, onto the panel of administrators. It's got a, a long history, um, but I'm really proud to be part of uh, a council that is uh, finally going to deliver something uh, in relation to this project. And um, look, I support all those comments you made, Madam Chair, about the regional scale and scope of the project, obviously the importance of getting that co-contribution from state or federal government. I'm pretty confident that we will get support for this. It's such um, a significant project uh, for the northern metropolitan area. Um, and as, as you said, Chair, that opportunity to celebrate and uh, educate about Aboriginal culture uh, to people broadly, not just Aboriginal people, mm. but non-Aboriginal people as well. So very happy to support it and well done to everyone who's worked so hard for so many years to bring it to this point. It's a very exciting step. Thank you, Mr. Eddy. I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour, the motion is carried. Thank you, Ms McCackie and Ms Mason. Uh, if we now move to item 5.1.2, 2022-23 Growing Suburbs Fund and Local Sports Infrastructure Fund, uh, and invite our new Director of uh, Customer and Corporate Services, Ms Renner, to provide a brief introduction to this item.
Thank you, Ms. Rena. Thank you, Chair. We are pleased to present a paper on a funding application for growing suburbs for the Growing Suburbs Fund for seven projects, totaling $7.6 million, and the Sports Infrastructure Fund for three projects, totaling $520,000. I'm pleased to hand over to Amanda Reid, our coordinator, Capital Programming and Reporting, to further expand on this paper. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Renner. Welcome, Ms. Reid. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, so the report that um, I have for you today is um, to let you know about the Growing Suburbs Fund and the Local Sports Infrastructure Funding that's recently become available. Um, as Ms. Renna mentioned, we've got a, a number of projects that we have submitted through these funding streams and we're seeking your support and approval of those priority projects that we have listed um, as this commits council to delivery and a financial contribution towards these applications if they are successful. Um, the projects that we have submitted for application are some of our high priority projects, such as the Aboriginal Gathering Place where we're seeking 5 million contribution towards that project um, and other projects um, that are priority within our four-year capital works program that provide places and spaces for our communities to connect and for increase in physical activities. Thank you very much, Ms. Reid. Administrators, do you have any questions in relation to this matter? Uh, I might start, Madam Chair, if I can. Um, of course. I note that uh, discussions have been held with uh, government personnel around the types of projects that we were proposing to put forward. I wonder whether um, you could talk a little bit more about that process and, and why we're effectively resolving on something that, as I read in the papers, has already been uh, submitted to the government. Thank you, um, Mr. Eddy. I think um, our CEO will respond to that particular question. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Administrator Eddie, for the question. Uh, so the way this works is the, the grants are announced uh, quite late in time by the state government, and uh, we have to put in a submission, which doesn't necessarily allow time for a council meeting, but the process allows for officers to make an early submission, but that needs to be followed up with a resolution of council, uh, as uh, Ms. Reid said, to formally endorse the position that if we're successful, we will put in the required funding and deliver those projects. So it's a, it's just a timing issue uh, with the way that this grant works with the state government, and it was a little later uh, this year. Um, thank if I Mr. Eddie, going, Madam Chair, yes, thank you, Mr. CEO. Uh, uh, the lion's share of the funds we're looking for under growing suburbs here is clearly for Aboriginal Gathering Place, which is one of our key priorities. Um, I suspect I know how you'll answer this question, but in those discussions with the government representatives, clearly we weren't discouraged from making such a sizeable request for funding for the gathering place as our top priority. Uh, yeah, thank you. Through the chair, um, that, that's correct. Um, so most of the grant programs that council takes part in, there's discussions with government departments, and, and sometimes we, we do receive uh, more information than we do on others. I think it's fair to say with the Growing Suburbs Fund, uh, we don't receive a great deal of advance advice, but certainly uh, any advice and information we have received to date and discussions with the state government directly and with local MPs has all been very positive. So we're fingers crossed. That's good. I'll take that as uh, we're being cautiously optimistic. And um, Mr. CEO, or, or perhaps one of the other officers, I notice in the Growing Suburbs projects we're asking for support for, there's a project called Atrium Reserve, which is also at the Quarry Hills Regional Parkland, as is the Gathering Place. Um, I wasn't able to see from the, the, the papers, though, any um, connection or proximity of the two projects. I wonder if you could provide, and for the audience, uh, some clarity around if and how those two projects interface or indeed not. Yeah, thank you, Administrator Eddie, and through the chair. I, I might ask uh, Ms. Reid to address that first, and if she's not able to answer that, then I'll cover that. Thank you, Ms. Reid. Would you like to provide a response? Sorry, just looking at the map to try and uh, 
explain it in the best way possible. Um, I believe this is a separate entrance node to where the Aboriginal gathering place is. Is that correct, Mr. Lloyd? Yeah, that's correct. Mr. I, I might, um, I might uh, actually hand over to uh, Ms. McCacky, who is uh, across the brief for both of these. Um, Ms. McCacky, I can provide an answer. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and thank you, C uh, thank you, CEO. Um, so it's um, there's a lot of shared infrastructure, particularly around the um, civil infrastructure, so the road that. Um, and the access way is actually a shared access way. So um, you think about a um, a hill, and you drive into the you drive into the the Quarry Hills Park. The, the playground is at the, the base of the hill, and you keep driving up the hill, and the gathering place is up the top of the hill. So there'll be lots of opportunities for connection between um, the gathering place and the Quarry Hills playground. Um, but they'll they have their own distinct entity and experience as well. But we'll certainly make use of some of the shared infrastructure that we're putting in to support both um, features. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further questions, administrators? Not from no? me, thank you, Chair. No, no, thank you. So do I have a mover for the officer recommendation for item 5.1.2? I'm happy to move that. Thank you, Administrator Eddy, and a seconder? Happy to do that, Chair. Thank you, Ms Duncan. Uh, Mr Eddy. Uh, just briefly, thank you, Chair. Yes, this is uh, it, it's important opportunity for us to, uh, I, I guess, put our best foot forward to get our, our, sh our share as much as we can of the Growing Suburbs Fund, being one of the municipalities with extraordinary growth, and that's what this fund is designed to support. Um, those seven projects that total $7.6 million in uh, asks, uh, let's not forget, need to be matched by the council, um, as well as with the uh, the sports infrastructure fund. With uh, we're asking for five hundred and twenty thousand, that also needs to be matched by council uh, funding. So that represents significant investment across mm -hmm. a range of projects from this council, and uh, pleasingly within uh, those projects is one of our number one priorities, as we've already spoken about this evening, in the Aboriginal uh, gathering place. Uh, so very happy to support what's being put forward here, and we'll keep our fingers crossed from this point on of a positive outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eddy. Ms. Duncan, do you wish to speak as well? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, just to note that um, obviously we've selected which grants we're going to put in for and we have been advocating strongly and got a, a pulse check, I would suggest, on what would be more likely than other projects. And just to really call out that we are asking for $5 million for the Aboriginal gathering place mm -hmm. from the Growing Suburbs Fund. And just to say well done to uh, the CEO and all of the team on that pre-work uh, to work out what the right number is to ask for. So I'm excited to see where we land on all of our funding requests and um, hopefully we'll know that we'll know that in time. But well done to the team on uh, selecting the right projects and then getting our submissions in in time. Thank you, Ms Duncan, well said. Uh, I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour, the motion is carried. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Renner and Ms. Reid. Uh, so if we move now to item 5.1.3, Regional Sports and Aquatic Centre at Mernda, business case, and again, uh, invite our Director of Community Wellbeing, Ms. McCackie, to provide a brief introduction to this item. Thank you, Chair. Um, so that we're very pleased to be able to present this very significant project tonight. Uh, the events of the past eight months have presented some, some considerable challenges when developing a final uh, business case for a project of this size, our biggest single investment in a social infrastructure project to date. Uh, building and construction costs have accelerated sharply during this period and had a significant impact on the quantity surveyor costs presented to council in December last year as part of the preliminary business case. Um, so the final business case really has worked really hard to be able to realise the project scope that was endorsed by Council in December last year. Um, and we've really worked hard to provide a prudent project path that realises the project scope and its associated benefits and outcomes. Um, and this ensures, um, this ensures that uh, this, this approach ensures that we want to be able to meet the needs of other parts of the city as well as this um, important um, initiative. 
So we're really presenting tonight a staged approach in this business plan and also want a partnership. Um, and that includes partnerships with other levels of government, such as key funders, as well as partnership with community through local sporting associations and peak bodies. I think it's worth reflecting tonight, given the, the project scale, um, that it's really about improving the quality of life for our residents. Um, and after two and a half years of pandemic, um, the community health and wellbeing has never been so important. So we really designed this project to be a to, to be a centre that plays a significant uh, role in wellbeing and recovery, um, and that will realise um, a couple of critical um, benefits. And so, for the 1.1 million visits that, that will come uh, visitors that will come and visit the, this centre uh, once it's fully complete throughout the whole stages, we're hoping that it will improve the health and wellbeing of our residents, including reducing some of our poor current health stats. We've got some of the highest proportion of overweight adults in the northeastern Melbourne region, um, third highest proportion of adults with type 2 diabetes in Victoria, about the sixth highest proportion of adults with heart disease in Victoria, with 44% of adults um, doing insufficient physical activity. Um, so on top of this, our municipality also has a lower rates of participation in formal sports and recreation pursuits and other municipalities. And we really need to shift the dial on this. And this project is a big part of that effort. But we also want to create opportunities for people of all backgrounds and abilities to be able to participate in sports, recreation and leisure opportunities. We want to remove barriers for women and girls to participate in physical activity. We want to reduce the risk of drownings, particularly in children. And we really want to foster a sense of place and civic pride and attract and retain future residents and visitors. Um, and lastly, but by no means least, we want to reduce the burden on our health system through an investment in preventative health and wellbeing programs. So I will pass over to uh, Ma uh, Manager Agata Chimaliski in a moment, but before I do, I'd just like to thank Agata and the many officers um, and personnel who have worked so hard um, to bring this report to Council tonight. And all the teams I mentioned before, well, all of those plus many more, including our comms and engagement teams, our transport teams, um, it's really been a, a very much a collaborative effort across the organisation and with um, external expertise as well. So I'll now introduce Agata Chmielewski, Manager of Strategic Projects, who will run through the key elements of the proposed staging and dates, um, and will also walk us through the key report recommendations. Over to you, Agata. Thank you, Ms. McKecky. The business case for the Regional Sports and Aquatic Centre at Manda that we're presenting for Council's consideration tonight has been developed using the State Government's High Value, High Risk Framework. The framework aims to ensure projects requiring a high level investment, such as this facility, are subject to a robust planning and procurement process. Preparation of the business case has been led by external consultants Deloitte and provides an independent assessment of the project, which includes an analysis of optimal facility scope, market conditions in the construction industry, project risks, as well as financially sustainable delivery options. Building on Council's previous work, the business case further confirmed that the Regional Sports and Aquatic Centre at Manda is a much needed facility to support the health and wellbeing of residents across the whole municipality. As Ms McKecky outlined, current statistics show that City of Whittlesea residents face some health challenges which a facility such as this one can significantly improve by providing opportunities for both formal and informal physical activity and enabling the community to connect through, through recreation and leisure. The business case identifies option two out of the four options assessed as best place to support the community's health and wellbeing and address the identified challenges. Option two proposes a holistic facility that provides sports supports, aquatic facilities, leisure facilities, multi-purpose spaces and allied health suites. The key focus as the project progresses is that the centre is designed to reduce participation barriers, procedures, abilities and backgrounds. A stakeholder oh, reference... Excuse me, Agata, and excuse me, Chair. I must just advise that the officers have spoken for five minutes. The Chair is able to, under the governance rules, allow another two minutes for presentation. Um, but Thank you. Interrupt. Thank you, Mr Joyce. Uh, I think... Given the importance and scale of this particular project, I'm happy to allow the further two minutes. Is it up to two minutes? Yes, There's not too much correct. to go. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Um, a stakeholder reference group will be established to work alongside the project team, which will include community members, local sporting clubs and industry peak bodies. 
A key aspect that needed to be considered in the development of the business case is that there has been a significant, escalate, significant escalation in construction costs due to the COVID-19 pandemic, which means that the cost to build the Regional Sports and Aquatic Centre at Manda is now estimated at $180 million. Extensive financial, financial modelling was undertaken to identify how Council can contribute, continue progressing these important projects under current market conditions, while also being financially responsible and able to continue to meet community needs across its established growth in rural areas in the short and long term. To this end, the, the report proposes that Council delivers the project in three stages. Stage one, which has already commenced and includes site establishment and detailed design for stage two. Stage two, which comprises construction of the indoor stadium and outdoor courts, as well as detailed design for stage three. And stage three will see the delivery of the aquatics and leisure components of the facility. The staging approach proposes prioritising delivery of the sports courts for two main reasons. The first being that demand for sports courts across the municipality currently far exceeds provision. There is an overall shortfall of 43 indoor courts and 32 outdoor netball courts, with the shortage being particularly pronounced in the Mernda, Doreen and South Morang areas where this facility will be located. And secondly, the sports courts will increase opportunities for women and girls to engage in physical activity, because at the moment, almost a third of women in the city of Whittlesea report that they get no exercise at all in a typical week. In addition to the need to stage the project, the financial modelling also shows that the scale of investment required means that council cannot deliver the project on its own and will need to partner with the state and or federal governments. The recommendations in the report are as read, but in summary, they propose that option two in the business case is endorsed and the project is delivered in three stages as described, with the project moving to commencement of stage two, which includes the delivery of the indoor and outdoor sports courts and detailed design of stage three. A stakeholder reference group will also be established in this stage. Stage two construction is proposed to commence in the 24-25 financial year, contingent upon a co-contribution of $40 million from other levels of government, in addition to Council's financial contribution of $47.99 million. Finally, Council will monitor market conditions in the construction industry and present funding for Stage 3 of the project, the Aquatics and Leisure Component, and in the 2025-26 financial year. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to both of you for that really comprehensive overview. And I think we put you under a lot of pressure given the time constraints, given it, this is such an important issue for council. So thank you very much. Uh, administrators, do you have any questions relating to this item? Ms Duncan or Mr Eddy? No, I don't, Chair. Thank you. That was a very comprehensive. Mr. Eddy? I uh, feel like I should have questions given the significance of this item, um, Madam Chair. I, I wonder if officers could talk a bit more about, I know it's a bit of crystal ball gazing, but the the estimated cost of this project has, has ballooned, let's put it um, the way it is, $70 million or thereabouts since we first endorsed the scope. I understand that's largely due to market conditions. Um, I guess it's about how we manage that going forward and uh, what's our capacity to continue to absorb those sorts of market conditions changing. I'd be interested to hear what sort of a strategy we have for managing that. Uh, Mr. Lloyd or Ms. McCackie, who would like to respond to that? Yeah, I'm happy. I, up to you, CEO. Yeah, I'm happy for you to respond to that, Ms. McCackie. Thank yeah, you, thank Ms. You. McCackie. A, thank you, Chair. It's a really pertinent question, um, Administrator Eddy, and um, it's certainly something that we have worked really hard with um, Slatteries, who's our quantity surveyors, and Deloitte, the sort of lead consultant, to look at um, ensuring that the... Um, the, the costings which are presented as part of this report tonight have got the escalations based on what their best modelling is around construction industry escalation costs and also labour costs. So um, it's, as they say, all models are wrong and some are useful and this is the best external independent advice we can get at this point in time. So those escalation costs are factored into the, the costs, project costs presented tonight. 
Thank you, Ms. Thank McKay. you. Um, Madam Chair, if I may, another question. Um, the proposal is to, to now stage this, and it, there are sound reasons I can see as to why we would, and not the least of those is our actual capacity to be able to deliver it both financially as well as um, within our delivery programs. Is it true to say, though, that we're prioritising where the most urgent need is? And that is, I think I read in the report, um, there's an immediate urgent need for more indoor and outdoor courts to provide for sporting activity, which is um, uh, pretty depressing when you look at the stats for the city of, of Whittlesea. I guess I'm looking for confirmation that while we've got to break this up into pieces, it's the most urgent need that we're going to be addressing first, correct? Yes, absolutely. I might, if I may, Chair, Oh, sorry, if I, if I may, Chair, uh, throw to a guard to just to go through those stats around the court's deficiency at the moment, particularly in the Dorian area. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, yes, so there's an overall shortfall of 43 indoor courts and 32 outdoor netball courts across the municipality and this region in particular where the facility will be located, so sort of the Mernda, Doreen, South Morang areas, that's one of the regions where the need is most pronounced. Um, and at the moment, we've got around half of the netball and basketball population having to go outside of the municipality in order to be able to participate in their of courts in the municipality. So um, the need is pretty great. Thank you. Could, could I just follow up that, please, Chair? The, that stat about people having to leave the municipality to be able to participate in those sports, do we have any sort of insights into how far they have to to travel to be able to do that? Is it like going next door or is it much further afield? Who, who would like to respond to that question? I'm happy to respond in that uh, netball is n not as regional as basketball. So if children or um, players are playing basketball, typically those um, travel patterns are much broader and range much further, but still it's mostly sort of inter-municipal inter LGA area, local government area travel, if that makes sense, because a lot of the um, court participation will be netball and that's um, that's the sort of travel that's um, leaching out of the, of the municipality due to a lack of provision within it. Thank you. And, and Thank you. Chair, mm. sorry, if I may, I, I, I would like to ask another question. It is around the financing of this. Um, we're making it pretty clear that this won't happen without significant financial support. We talk about other levels of government, but potentially there are other financial sources as well, um, philanthropic, et cetera. I'm not sure of the, um, the likelihood of being able to achieve that. Um, but what is uh, our best guess, the likelihood of being able to achieve 50% funding from other levels of government? Is, is that something that does happen in other locations or is that really the upper limit of what we we would expect? Uh, Mr Lloyd, if I could ask you to respond to that question. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so look, in answer to that question, uh, who knows, I think is the answer to that question. It is at the higher end of what's been achieved in some other facilities, but certainly in discussions with uh, Sport and Rec Victoria, uh, they understand that we have a, a really great need. Uh, they've received advocacy directly from, for example, Netball Victoria and Basketball Victoria and, and Netball Australia uh, on the needs for the courts and the dire shortages, and that's their words, not mine, uh, that they're experiencing in this area. So we hope with the joint advocacy of council, our community, all of those sporting groups, um, and making sure that we brief the departments appropriately, that we'll be able to receive that level of funding. Obviously, if we receive a lower offer of funding, that's something that council would need to consider at that time. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Lloyd. CEO. And perhaps one last, if I may, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, this is such a significant item. Um, my last question was really uh, to the CEO about future decision points in this process. Like if we adopt this recommendation tonight, are you confident that future councils will have sufficient opportunity to interrogate and consider the next steps, depending what other things happen down the track in terms of financial costs, escalation, 
etc. Um, in terms of us making the most responsible decision we can tonight. Yeah, so through the chair, uh, yes, I am. So the way that the recommendation has been structured tonight has this council signing off on the commencement of stage two, so the building of the stadium and of the courts, but what we've and the design of the aquatic centre. But what we've done is set up an, an additional decision point for the next council to make the decision at that point of whether to proceed with the aquatic centre based on the in government funding. It'd be based on where the market is at at that point. So yes, that, that was the, the key reason uh, behind that recommendation to split this into stages. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lloyd. All right, no further questions, I take it. Uh, so uh, I'm really happy to move the officer recommendation for item 5.1.3. Uh, and do I have a seconder? Seconder. Thank you, Mr. Eddy. Uh, I think it's probably important to say at the outset that I didn't ask any questions in relation to this important project. And Mr. Eddy rightly talks about the fact that it is such a complex capital project. It's in fact the most complex capital project that this council or probably any future council at Whittlesea is likely to ever consider given, given its scale and size. Uh, and I know that Mr Joyce will be reminding me at the two minute mark, uh, but I have got a number of uh, comments that I did want to make because I think it's really important publicly that the administrators are very open about the basis on which we are about to determine on this matter. And I noted it earlier when we were considering, considering the Aboriginal gathering place, but likewise in relation to this particular item, we have done our own due diligence in relation to the Regional Sports and Aquatic Centre in Mernda. Uh, and I note regional, this is not a Mernda facility, it is a regional facility for the benefit of Whittlesea residents uh, and across the whole municipality. So we've had full access to the suite of key documents that are relevant to this particular proposal. And there are many, many documents that we have reviewed. Uh, there's many Whittlesea strategic documents, and I'm not going to go through what they are, that relate to this particular area. Uh, Ms. McCackie talked about key health and wellbeing indicators, and all of those documents are really well referenced in the officer report and in the business plan. Uh, as administrators, we've all personally and very carefully reviewed the full business plan, the options assessment paper, social value model, and commercial in confidence documents. And we've also reviewed the outcomes of previous community consultation regarding this major facility, which have actually occurred over many years. It's not just over the past year. Uh, right to the present time, when we've had comment in the form of budget and community plan action plan submissions on this very subject. And it would be very safe to say that there are different community views in relation to the approach council should take in, in respect of this matter. Uh, to complement all of our own reviews of those documents, we've also had the opportunity to have multiple briefings from council officers, but also importantly from independent specialist advisors, including leisure industry advisors, quantity surveyors, uh, and economic or business planning analysts. So for me personally, after really careful consideration uh, on this matter, I've come to a very clear support, supporting position uh, of the officer recommendations in essence, that the only responsible approach to this major capital facility is a staged approach. Uh, and there are a number of reasons why I've come to that determination. We've got an obligation to ensure that we remain financially sustainable as a council into the future and not burdened with excessive debt. Uh, we don't wanna leave a legacy of debt into the future. 
We also really need to ensure that we have the capacity, and that this is a comment that's also been made by council officers, to fund other much needed infrastructure projects across the municipality. Uh, and this point has also been made by a number of community members. We're a rapidly growing municipality uh, with um, a growing population and competing needs and we've got very heavy infrastructure requirements for both the newly developing areas, but also for the more established areas within Whittlesea. So the staging approach really gives us the best opportunity to maximise external funding and to try to secure those grants uh, over several years and for multiple government grant programs. So we are seeking that $40 million. So staging just gives us more time to progress, not just securing the funds, but also our advocacy approach. Uh, Ms. McCacky talked about the volatility in the construction industry, and we've looked at the documentation in relation to significant cost escalations, shortages in supply of construction materials and labour. Uh, and... Um, Administrator Eddie asked a question about prioritising the indoor and outdoor sports courts, and we got the, uh, again, it's well documented within the documentation, but the fact that uh, we've got some 50% of our registered netball and basketballers, and I can see Mr Joyce about to tell yes. me that I've reached um, my two-minute two mark, but... The, the five minute mark for the mover. Oh. Um, you can request by motion to have an extension of two minutes. Could so I, could I please, I've only got a few concluding uh, comments, but could I please request uh, a, could I move a motion to, or have one of my colleagues move? I move to an have extension a, of time. Thank you, do I have a seconder? Thank you, Ms Duncan. Um, Vote. Just, Oh, sorry. All those in favour, the motion is carried. Thank you, Administrator Eddie. Um, just to make a few concluding comments, uh, I was talking about the prioritisation of the indoor and outdoor sports courts, which really is important, I believe, to address one of the most significant sporting needs that we have sooner rather than later. But I think it's important to also note that we still very much support the provision of a 50 metre multipurpose pool and the staging approach will also enable the detailed design of the aquatic component to occur concurrent with the leisure component. So in, in conclusion, I'm fully supportive now of the stage approach to the development of the regional sports and aquatic facility at Mernda. Uh, and I'm also strongly supportive of the proposed governance fr framework where the CEO is the key project sponsor and the full executive leadership team comprise the board to e oversee this really important project. And I think the, a project of this magnitude warrants that sort of governance structure. So in concluding, uh, I also would echo Ms McCackie's comment of thanking staff from right across the organisation uh, for the enormous amount of work that has been required to get to the point that we are at the moment. And it includes yourself, Ms McCackie, uh, and all of the members of the executive leadership team. So thank you for allowing me the extended period to talk about this really important initiative. Uh, and could I invite the seconder to also speak? Thank Mr. You, Madam Chair. I, I will be I will be brief because I think you've hit all the, the main points. Uh, obviously by seconding this, I flagged that I do intend to support the recommendation. Um, I think the temptation would be to stop with all these uh, cost escalations that are happening, but they're happening everywhere. Um, we're still going to have to face meeting these needs in some way in the future, um, right across the municipality, in fact. Um, and I think what the officers have brought back is a logical and sensible way to approach this, given that there is so much that we don't know about what will occur in, in the coming years. So to break this up and 
have some uh, clear decision points for future councils to make, I think is responsible and appropriate. Um, we're making no bones about the fact that we're going to be reliant on significant financial support from other, serv uh, other sources for this to be viable, and there's going to be a lot of work required to, uh, to achieve that. Um, but as we've heard, the need for particularly indoor and outdoor courts to support uh, the sporting needs in the municipality, that's urgent and immediate. And even under this uh, scenario, we're still a couple of years away from being able to deliver uh, with this facility on those needs. So clearly we need to be looking at other more uh, short-term solutions. Um, I'm, I'm reminded that we had a coffee with council session in Doreen last week and I spent a bit of time chatting with a couple of people from the junior netball, um, Mernda Junior Netball I think it was, uh, who really brought this fact home to me, how difficult they are finding it to, uh, to, to, to get their young people onto courts uh, and the deals that they're having to do with other groups and um, uh, sites to try and get access to courts is it's quite extraordinary and multiply that by many times and you've got a sense of the need that exists and it's not just Whittlesea folks that's dealing with this this is this is happening more broadly as well which brings me to the other point about um, this facility will be regional uh, it'll be not just Whittlesea there will be as we've got people leaving our municipality to use other facilities we'll have people coming here to use these facilities I think that's a great argument to support the need for other levels of government supporting this financially because uh, Whittlesea will be certainly uh, doing its part but others also uh, need to the other thing we have haven't really said, Madam Chair, that I think bears mentioning. People will be disappointed that the aquatic component of this won't be delivered as soon as they would like. Um, unfortunately, the harsh reality of this, when you look at the numbers, is we can't do it all now. We can't afford to do it all now. And uh, while we've made some key decisions about what that facility will look like and contain, um, future councils are going to be making those decisions uh, quite clearly and quite appropriately. So I'm comfortable with the staged approach and the checks and balances that, uh, that officers have managed to put into this proposal. And uh, I think we've got to support it because uh, we can't do nothing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eddy. Ms. Duncan, would you like to make any further comment? Sure. Um, I agree with everything that's been said here tonight, so I'm not going to rehash what's already been talked about. I think, uh, to your point, Chair, we've had significant briefings on this project over the journey. Um, and whilst, you know, I've got no questions because I'm extremely well briefed by the officers and to thank them for their work. And this is the, the biggest sort of significant piece of infrastructure for the municipality and for those that will come in from outside our borders, so to speak. Um, and I'm more than comfortable with supporting uh, the recommendation from officers and just to congratulate them on the powerhouse of work that's gone into this. Um, and it's about progress for the city and that's what we're doing here. So thank you, Craig and Mr. Lloyd and your team, um, because there has been significant due diligence done um, by ourselves as administrators. We haven't entered into this lightly. So well done to all and I do support this. Thank you, Ms. Duncan. I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour, the motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, if we move to item 5.2.2, Bintz Road Discontinuous Harvest Home Road to Lehmans Road. Uh, and uh, if I could just also note at the outset that we had our earlier submission from Ms. Bellot on this subject. Um, so could I ask Ms. Wood, the Director of Infrastructure and Environment, to briefly introduce this item? Um, excuse me, Chair, have we missed an item? Oh, sorry. Thank you very much, Ms. Duncan. We have. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, thank you. I'm glad that you're on the ball this evening. Uh, item 5.2.1, 2022-19 Drainage Maintenance and Reinstatement. And again, if I could please introduce our Director of Infrastructure and Environment, 
Ms Wood to provide a brief um, introduction to this item. Thank you, Ms Wood. Thanks, Chair. I was quickly shuffling notes there, but um, so... <laughs> Just, I was just um, <laughs> testing whether you were on the ball. <laughs> Quick introduction. Um, so this report is just regarding the drainage and sweeping services that we undertake through council and along our roads um, and just proposes a contract to a, a contractor. But I've got Sam Bechet with me today, the senior infrastructure engineer, who can just talk to the report a little bit and then we'll um, take any questions. Thanks, Debbie. Thank um, so I'll take the report as written and just summarise by saying um, the city of Wilsey has uh, a road network 1,200 kilometres long and a drainage network nearly 2,000 kilometres long. Um, the street sweeping of roads and, and cleaning of drains are routinely done through in-house resources and external contractors. This contract enables the better use of external resources to manage the peaks and demand and improve the way we service our assets. The recommended contractor for street sweeping came out at the cheapest and the recommended contractor for draining, drain cleaning ranked very highly in their capabilities and capacities. Um, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Bechet. Um, administrators, any questions in relation to this item? No, Chair, it's fairly straightforward. No. So do I have a mover for the officer recommendation for item 5.2.1? Uh, yes, Chair, I'm happy to move this one. Thank you, Ms Duncan. And a seconder? Seconded. Thank you, Mr Eddy. Uh, would either of you like to speak to as mover and seconder? No, thanks. Uh, Mr Eddy? No, import, Im important task to be uh, maintaining the networks and this is uh, a necessary step, but um, comfortable with the recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Eddy. Uh, on that note, I'll put the item to a vote. All those in favour, the motion is carried. Thank you very much. Now, deja vu, we're moving on to item 5.2.2, which is Bintz Road discontinuance, Harvest Home Road to Lehman's Road. And again, if I could just make that note that we had uh, our earlier submitter uh, in attendance, Ms Bellot, to speak on this subject. Uh, and if I could again invite Ms Wood to introduce this item. Thanks, Chair. Um, so we have been out to consultation with the proposed closure of Vince Road, um, and this report is just giving some feedback around that proposal and also our, our recommendation around that. But I have Mr. Arishdeep Singh here with me tonight, um, the Manager of Urban Design and Transport, and I'll hand over to Arishdeep just to, to give us a brief overview of the report. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Wood. Um, I hope uh, you all can uh, hear me properly. Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, we are here to, um, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Um, we are here to present a report to resolve permanent road closure of section of Vince Road between Harvest Home Road and Lehman's Road in Willard. Um, as uh, as Ms. Wood highlighted, uh, that we at its November meeting, Council resolved to commence the formal consultation for permanent discontinuance of this section of Vince Road in accordance with the Section 12 of uh, Road Management Act. Um, following the resolution, consultation process was undertaken between November and April this year. Uh, cons uh, consultation was undertaken by a combination of written notices to the joining property owners and occupiers, notice in Whittlesea Review and why engage Whittlesea. Um, as part of the consultation, Council received uh, three written responses from community members, two in favour and, and one against, and all three submitters were were contacted and invited to, to talk to their uh, talk to their submissions. Um, as uh, you highlighted earlier, uh, Madam Chair, that we had Ms. Bullo, who spoke to her submission earlier. Um, under uh, Section 12 of Road Management Act, the Council is also required to consult with the Department of Transport. Um, following that, we have received uh, a report uh, stating that Department of Transport does not have objection to the proposal. Council officers diligently considered all the feedback and responses from, from the respondents. There was a strong support for closure of this section of the road from local residents living within the vicinity of the road. 
Um, where um, where the respondents wanted Binstro to remain closed, the general theme was that they saw it as a substitute of Epping Road. <clears throat> uh, with the with um, with Salt Lake Boulevard in that runs parallel to Binstro Road and other local streets within the area complete now, the local network is deemed to support um, uh, of the traffic operational needs of the area. Um, in in closing, I'd like to highlight that. Binge road closure of this section is in line with a long-term transport strategy of, uh, of the area and would like to put forward the recommendations from the report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Singh. And I, I just wonder whether I might start off with just a couple of um, questions. Um, I wonder whether you could clarify whether the CFA, the SCS or Ambulance Victoria have provided specific feedback yet regarding the proposal. I note that obviously there's been a number of other authorities that have. Um, uh, Madam Chair, we haven't received uh, uh, any response from CFA, Ambulance, Victoria or SES as part of this proposal. Um, I, can I can elaborate a little bit with the CFA point of view. Um, as part of the local structure plan, which is Quarry Hills mm -hmm. PSP, uh, CFA was a referral authority and they okay. did provide a response to that, but did not highlight any objection to, to being okay. road closure. Okay, thank you. So they've actually provided some feedback through the structure plan development. Yeah. The structure plan shows that Bins Road will be closed Yep. as it will be subsumed by E6 uh, in the future. Um, and CFA has not objected to that proposal okay. as part of the local Thank structure plan. Thank you. J just as a, a second question, if I could, I note within the officer report that um, there is some detail about the crash rates or incidents that had um, uh, occurred previously. Have we got any any there's any further data regarding what's happened post the initial closure? Have there been any incidents? Um, so since the um, yeah, uh, since uh, it has been closed, we have been pretty much in in COVID era where the trans uh, I'll say the transport numbers have been or the road users have been low. So we haven't had any recent incidents which that can be brought to, brought to the attention. Okay, thank you. Uh, administrators, any further questions of Mr. Singh, Mr. Eddy? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Singh, when we talk about the E6 freeway, are we talking about the outer metropolitan ring? Is that the, is, is that the E6? It will be the extension of uh, our, our metropolitan ring road. So um, are we saying that if we don't close this now, it will be eventually closed regardless because of the requirements for the E6 extension? Yes, Administrator Eddie. Okay, I just wanted to be clear on that because some of the language was a little bit vague, but it, it is definitely going to be required at some point in the future. So. A future council would need to close it anyway, uh, or it would be taken office um, as that project occurred. Yes, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any further questions, administrators? No. Uh, I'm happy then to move the officer recommendation for item 5.2.2. Do I have a seconder? Seconded. Thank you, uh, Mr. Eddy. Uh, I'm just going to make a few brief comments on this one, but I just wanted to note that I'm very supportive of the officer recommendation for a few reasons. Um, the proposal to discontinue Bince Road, Harvest Home Road to Lehmans Road has clearly been supported by the majority of residents in the immediate vicinity. Uh, and in fact, the report indicates quite well that the majority of people who have opposed the proposal live outside the Epping North and Willert area. Uh, and it does appear that a number of people have used the Bince Road route as a shortcut to Epping Road. Uh, clearly, this section of road has already been closed since March 2021. Uh, 
Uh, and I asked the question about crash rates. Clearly, there were road safety issues prior to that time. Uh, and uh, in concluding, I also note that um, uh, the recommendation is supported by the Victoria Police, including all the local stations uh, and Greensboro Highway Patrol, and also by the other authorities, Osnet, Telstra, NBN, and Melbourne Water. So on that basis, I'm supportive of the officer recommendation. Uh, Mr. Eddy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I support all those comments. There are other options to this road. It's not like it's the only access. Um, we talk about it being, uh, having a history of being a shortcut. I think we used to call that a rat run. We probably mm. still do. Um, it's um, it, its history is uh, inauspicious, uh, shall we say? Um, I, I think this is an appropriate decision. I am, and sorry, I should have asked a question. I'm mindful when Mrs. Bellow spoke to us earlier in the evening. Um, she, as a local resident, was supportive. She also talked about dust issues, so I hope we've taken that on notice. And I'm not sure whether this will resolve that or whether there's some other work that needs to be done. I just, uh, I just hope we're uh, taking that into account. Um, I'm happy to support this, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any further comments, Ms Duncan? No. I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Thank you, Mr Singh. Uh, item 5.2.3, 74A Church Street, Whittlesea, Demolition and Heritage Overlay. Uh, and if I could uh, invite Mr. Justin O'Mara, who's our Director of Planning and Development, to introduce this item. Thank you, Chair. And I'd like to introduce our Planning Officer, Lachlan Ewell, who's um, the author of this report and will provide a brief overview of the report and officer recommendation. Thank you, Lachlan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr. O'Mara. So this application is a council initiated project and proposes the removal of the existing toilet facility and construction of a new automated toilet facility at 74 Church Street in Woodlesea. Council has been actively engaged with the community members and the courthouse association. Uh, public notification was undertaken by the way of signage on site and letters to adjoining properties throughout the planning process. Uh, one objection was received during the advertising period. Uh, this objection was in relation to the operational hours. Uh, the operational hours have since been clarified um, as per the report and uh, the objection is subsequently mm -hmm. withdrawn. The facility shares a site with the Whittlesea Courthouse, which is protected by the heritage overlay. Uh, the courthouse was originally constructed in 1864 and acts as one of the oldest functioning buildings in the municipality. Uh, the, the existing toilet facility does not share any historical significance with the courthouse and its removal is not considered to impact the significance of the site. Uh, the proposed facility is to be constructed to the east of the existing facility. Uh, the automated facility is encased in a shell constructed of brick and colour bond steel materials. Uh, the location of the facility ensures sight lines to the courthouses are retained, uh, while the materials allow clear delineation between the new facility and heritage structures. The facility will improve community safety and hygiene and reduces vandalism through automated cleaning and vandal resistant materials. Uh, the application also proposes the inclusion of additional public seating and bike racks, which improve the amenity of the site. Overall, the upgrade of the site facilities is considered to provide a benefit to the community amenity. Uh, the proposal is consistent with clauses 15.01-1L, Heritage Conservation and Heritage Overlay Areas, and 43.01, Heritage Overlay of the Whittlesea Planning Scheme, and therefore officer recommendation is the application be approved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Uh, administrators, do you have any questions? Um, yes, Chair, for Mr. Omar, I think, initially. Um, it's unusual that an application like this would come to council, but is that because of the fact that it does have a heritage overlay? Thank you, Administrator Duncan, and through you, Chair. Um, it's the, the reason why the application is coming to a council meeting is because um, this is a um, permit being requested by council. So for transparency reasons, it's coming to a council meeting for decisions. So it's very transparent. I mean, council's making a decision on its own planning permits. So it's not, not because it's a heritage matter. Heritage matters like this would normally be dealt with under delegated authority by officers. Okay. Okay. Thank you for clarifying Thank that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Mara. Any further questions? No? Uh, if there's no further questions, do I have a mover for the officer recommendation for item 5.2.3? 
I'm happy to move that, Chair. Thank you. And a seconder? Seconded. Thank you, Mr. Eddy. Uh, would the mover or seconder like to speak to this item? Ms. Duncan? I wouldn't have thought so, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Duncan. Mr. Eddy? No, nothing to add. Thank you, Chair. And nor do I. So on that note, I'll put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Thank you very much, Mr. Yule and Mr. O'Mara. Um, item 5.2.4, proposed planning scheme amendment, application of specific controls overlay at 105 Hunters Road, South Morang. And again, if I could ask Mr. O'Mara to introduce this item. Thank you, Chair. And I'd like to introduce Liam Wilkinson, our Unit Manager of Strategic Planning, who will provide a brief overview of the report and officer recommendation. Thank you, Liam. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilkinson. Thank you, Mr. O'Mara, and thank you, Chair. So this report actually re relates to uh, the Aboriginal Gathering Place project, which was discussed earlier in, in the meeting. And this report relates specifically to the uh, creating the planning framework to facilitate the project. So the re report recommends that council commence a process to amend the Whittlesea planning scheme to facilitate the project in the Quarry Hills Park. So the AGP, as we heard, is a significant project and an important one for our Aboriginal community of both local and regional significance. The proposed amendment will apply a specific control overlay to the subject site, which will permit both the use and development of the site for the Aboriginal gathering place. Given the importance of the project, it is recommended that council write to the Minister of Planning and request that the amendment be processed through a fast track process. This will limit some of the formal statutory notice required for the planning scheme amendment, but noting there will be significant engagement um, with key stakeholders as part of the planning and design of the facility. Therefore, the report recommends that Council commence the planning scheme amendment process. A second resolution is also included that should the Minister for Planning not support a fast track process, that Council proceed with the amendment through the standard planning scheme amendment process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilkinson. Uh, any questions of Mr. Wilkinson from the administrators? Mr. Eddy. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm intrigued by this fast track process. Uh, did they often get uh, agreed to by the minister? And have we given the minister a heads up we'll be asking for one? So they are often um, agreed to for most significant projects of either state or regional significance. A lot of um, state infrastructure projects are facilitated through this process where the minister themselves will prepare and approve the, the amendment. And there have been some discussions with uh, officers at the, the department um, and others to ensure that this is a project that they will consider uh, potentially under this uh, fast track process. That's good to know. Thank you, Mr. Wilkinson. Thank you. Any further questions, administrators? Um, yes, just one question. That given this this project and the require the requirement to try to fast track, but the project is of cultural significance for the city, do you think that will help our cause to get it through on a fast track um, plan with the minister? I can answer. Yeah. That. Thank you, Mr. O'Mara. In the first instance, thank you, Administrator Duncan, and through you, Chair. Um, Administrator Duncan, we, 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 we're putting the case strongly that this, this is a project of regional significance, so beyond beyond the municipal boundaries, <laughs> and therefore we feel that those are the requirements that um, Ms, Mr Wilkinson just outlined regarding the fast track process need, be, needing to be of either regional or state significance, which we feel meets, meets those requirements. So, look, we'll be putting the case forward very strongly, and, um, and we hope the... Planning Minister, if, if Council does endorse this, we hope that the Planning Minister would also see fit to, to consider it fit for the fast track process. Thank you, an important question. Thank you. 
Uh, any further questions? Uh, just a quick follow up, if I may, Madam Chair. What What's the implication for the project if the fast track process is not agreed to? Thank, thank you, Administrator Eddie, and through you, Chair. What it would mean is there would be extra time required to undertake the planning scheme amendment process. It would it would ex could potentially extend the process by up to another twelve months beyond a fast track process. So, um, given the time criticality of this significant regional project, and also the fact that, as as per Mr. Wilkinson's introductory comments about really extensive community engagement being planned to be undertaken by council about the Aboriginal gathering project. Um, we feel that in this instance, um, it is warranted that to go down this fast track process because the community will still be engaged appropriately. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, administrators, any further questions or can I ask for a mover for the officer recommendation for item 5.2.4? I'm happy to move that, Chair. Thank you, Administrator Eddie. And a seconder? Seconded, Chair. Thank you, Administrator Duncan. Mr. Eddie, would you like to speak to the item? Thank you, Chair. Look, it's pretty straightforward. This is really the start of the process to allow us to deliver that project we've spoken about a couple of times tonight, the Aboriginal Gathering Place. It needed its own section of the agenda, I think, such as the importance and the, uh, mm. the number of mentions mm. it's getting on tonight's uh, uh, meeting. So uh, let's hope that the Minister is amenable to a fast track process so we can keep this uh, moving uh, as quickly as possible and I so move. Thank you Mr Eddie. Administrator Duncan any further comments? No thanks Chair. Thank you. Uh, I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Thank you Mr Wilkinson. Uh, item 5.2.5 uh, domestic Animal Management Plan 2021 to 2025, Implementation of Cat Management Actions. And again, Mr Amara, I'll hand over to yourself initially. Thank you, Chair. And I'd like to introduce our Manager of Compliance and Environmental Health, Debbie Blanford, who's going to provide a brief overview of the report and officer recommendations. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Mr. O'Mara, and good evening, Council. The report presented to you tonight um, features some recommendations regarding the cat management actions that were identified in the Domestic Animal Management Plan, which was adopted by Council in November last year. There's a whole range of information that was considered to inform the recommendations in the report before you. The first was the welfare of cats and minimising the risk of being injured, contracting diseases, or having unwanted litters of kittens. Secondly, we considered the impact on the local environment and the many native birds, marsupials and reptiles who call the city of Whittlesea home, but are often subjected to being attacked by roaming cats. We considered feedback from our recent community engagement and the advice of industry experts, including vets, animal welfare organisations, environmental committees and wildlife experts. And lastly, we completed benchmarking with other councils across the state and found out what other councils have learned from introducing similar initiatives. We had an excellent response to our community engagement with over 1,800 people participating either in person or online. And of those who participated, over 80% supported some form of cat curfew with 45% supporting a 24 hour curfew and 35% supporting a dusk till dawn curfew. And further to that, we also had over 82% of people supporting mandatory cat desexing. So based on all of that information, the report that's before you this evening recommends that council introduces a 24 hour cat curfew or cat confinement laws and mandatory desexing for all cats being registered for the first time with the city of Whittlesea. It's also recommended that if council introduces these initiatives that implementation occurs in 12 months time to enable time for council to help the community and their cats to transition to the new rules via implementation of a comprehensive community transition plan, which would include things like promoting our subsidized desexing program, partnering with animal welfare organizations and local vet clinics to share information and practical tips for confining cats or transitioning cats to a confined lifestyle, exploring partnerships with local community groups to produce do-it-yourself cat enclosure workshops and also producing video content with practical tips and advice from our animal management officers. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Blandford. Um, and I wonder whether I might start the ball rolling. Uh, I've got a couple of questions, if I could. Um, I note in the officer recommendation part three that relates to cat dissexing, uh, there's a clear indication that this requirement does not apply to animals exempt under the Domestic Animals Act 1994 in accordance with attachments 5.2.5.1. Uh, I note that within the body of the report, the provisions are clearly spelt out in relation to those exemption, but they're not included or detailed in the attached order. Uh, and I wonder, Mr. O'Mara, if you could just indicate why that is the case. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, the reason why the proposed orders are being drafted like that, where they refer to the exemptions outlined in the State Government Domestic Animal Management Plan, or Management Act, sorry, not Management Plan, um, is because if the State Government does make changes to those exemptions, exemptions in the future, it means Council is always in line with that. So if we had, about, if we had done the opposite, which was outline those State Government exemptions, it would then require Council every time to the state government updated their act to then do a subsequent um, update to the orders and bring it to a council meeting. It just, it's just more streamlined. It makes it ensure, ensures that council is always consistent with the state government domestic animal management act. Thank you, Mr. Amara. But I, I presume then that as we we go out on the public education and community consultation, it'll be very clear what those exemptions are, even though they're not contained in the order. Yes, that's right, Chair. Um, in, in terms of any community engagement, re the proposed mandatory desexing, those exemptions would be spelled out very clearly as they currently apply. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then just my last question is, council cat trapping programs in parkland areas is actually mentioned in the officer report, but there's no specific detail uh, in respect of what those programs are. Can you perhaps just um, clarify what's being proposed in this respect? Yes, thank you, Chair. So Council's Sustainable Environment Department do have plans that are prepared to undertake cat trapping. They haven't yet been implemented, but that'll be considered um, over the course of the coming months as well. Okay. Thank you, Mr O'Mara. Um, do my colleagues have any further questions in relation to this item? Mr Eddy? Uh, I do have a couple. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, f firstly, I, I note that we've, we've looked at all 79 councils in the state to see what they're doing in relation to this issue, and I get that this is a particularly topical issue for councils at the moment. I am interested to know about our, our, our neighbours and uh, what are the chances of us having some sort of commonality to our approach with our neighbours? Because I, I hesitate to say, but I don't think cats recognise municipal boundaries, and we may, um, you know, find that's an issue, particularly on our on our borders. Uh, anyone care to comment on that, Mr. Amara? Um, I'm I'm happy to start the response, and then I might ask Debbie to add a little bit more detail. Um, so thank you for the question, Administrator Eddie, and through you, Chair. Um, look, at the moment, the, the one active council that's considering um, potentially introducing um, cat confinement laws and, and desexing is the City of Moreland. Um, they, in fact, they've been undertaking community engagement in a similar sort of time frame to us. They've just finished their community engagement exercise as well as doing other, other work as well through as identified in their domestic animal management plan. So we'll have to wait and see what comes out of that, that council report and that council decision. But um, I might ask Debbie to add any other councils, any other joining councils she knows of that have plans in the future to, to look at this issue. Thank you, Mr. O'Mara. Ms. Blandford? Through you, Chair. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag in, in regards to our immediately abutting neighbours. So we have Darabin, uh, Mitchell and Nillambic all have a sunset to sunrise curfew in place at the moment, um, with Moreland and Murrindindi currently um, considering a curfew. Um, Banyal and Hume currently don't have a curfew or, as far as I'm aware, any plans to um, introduce a curfew. And then in regards to compulsory desexing, currently Moreland and Nillambic have compulsory desexing for cats. None of our other neighbours have um, compulsory desexing orders in place. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ms Blanford. Um, Mr Eddy. I have a few, um, Madam Chair, if you'll bear with me. Um, so uh, Ms Blanford mentioned earlier about looking to learn from other councils that have, have gone down this path ahead of us. I am particularly interested to know how we're going to benefit from that experience. And if we've particularly spoken with those councils, and I can't recall who they are, but I'm aware that there are some that have gone down a path that we're going down and then stopped or backtracked. And I'd, I'd, I'd like to know that we're across why that happened in their process so we can avoid those sorts of um, pitfalls. I'm, I'm happy to start answering Thank that question. Thank you, Mr Amara. Thank you, Administrator Eddie, and through you, Chair. So um, as outlined in the report, we've identified that where councils have introduced, for example, um, some form of cat confinement laws, that's the the impact of that has been a reduced number of euthanized, um, cats that need to be euthanised. So that's been one of the benefits of it, as well as the associated benefits of um, impacts to native wildlife as well, and nuisance, nuisance complaints from, from neighbours, etc. Um, I might ask Debbie to um, outline any, any additional information that we obtained regarding councils that may have commenced a process of looking at um, introducing some of these orders and then stopped. Um, Debbie, do you have any additional information in respect of that? We didn't actually have any feedback in regards to councils who had commenced the process and then stopped. But one of the themes that did come through speaking with other councils was um, those that had introduced a sunset to sunrise curfew um, found it to be quite um, difficult to operationalise in terms of um, being able to prove when a cat was out causing a nuisance or, or what have you. So. Um, of the, I think it's 17 councils who have those in place, um, 10 of them will be now considering moving to a 24 hour curfew to make it easier for the community to report cat issues and also for the council to be able to resolve those issues for residents. That was my next question about the limitations of the sunrise to sunset curfew, which you've touched on, Ms Blanford. I wonder if you could talk a bit more about that. You mentioned the word operationalise. What do you mean by that? through you, Chair. Thank you, Administrator Eddie. Thank you. Um, it's very difficult um, for council officers to be able to resolve ongoing cat nuisance issues when there's a sunset to sunrise curfew in place, just due to the fact it's very difficult um, to know when that cat was trapped. So it may have been caught during daylight hours, but unless somebody has witnessed that or there's CCTV of the cat being trapped, it's really difficult for council to um, enforce, particularly for repeat offenders, and then resolve the issue that, um, that was being brought to us by other residents. So that seemed to be the theme throughout our benchmarking. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the, the last question I had was uh, to hear a bit more about the practical support initiatives that you, you talk about um, and how um, we're going to be getting those out and about in our, in our community if we resolve on this tonight as you've recommended. I'm happy to start answering that question. Thank you, Mr. Amara. Through you, Chair, and I'll ask Debbie to add some more detail. Um, Administrator Eddie, um, Debbie outlined at a high level some of those key key activities and they're wide ranging. This is if council does resolve as per the office recommendation this evening, um, the recommendation also includes a 12 month transition period. And the reason why we're rec recommending a 12 month period of time is to ensure that there is enough time and, and, and a wide range of um, information opportunities to get information, but also practical advice to um, cat owners as well about things that they can do to um, help confine their cats to their property. But also, as is outlined in the report, the recommendations also enable um, cat owners to take their cat outside the property as well. Um, as long as the cat's under effective control, that's the term, effective control, similar to dogs. You know, dogs need to be on a leash or in um, some sort of restraint. And there are different options available for cat owners to take their cats outside the property to remain under effective control as well. It's very much an emerging space with a lot of, um, a lot of great tips and advice. Uh, Debbie, have you got anything else you'd like to add in terms of the, what information and how we'd be getting that out to the community? Thanks, Mr. Omara. 
and through you, Chair. Um, there's a lot of excellent information out there already, so we wouldn't need to reinvent the wheel. There's a really great initiative that's a partnership between Zoos Victoria and RSPCA Victoria called Safe Cat, Safe Wildlife. And there's a lot of really great ideas on there, practical tips for how to either train very young cats to um, live in a confined lifestyle or to transition um, maybe some older cats into a more confined lifestyle. So our plan would be to use um, the resources through that program and other programs that are already out there and to partner through local vet clinics and animal welfare organisations to get the word out. And then in terms of practical support, we're looking to partner with local community groups. So for example, local men's sheds to hold do-it-yourself workshops for either cat enclosures or how to install cat netting, things like that. So really practical tips, as well as obviously information and advice from our animal management offices as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Blanford. Uh, any further questions, administrators? No? Uh, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll then move the officer recommendation for item 5.2.5, but with a new part five and six as follows, and it will be projected. Uh, we provided this to officers earlier, but I am going to be difficult and suggest a further amendment to part five on the basis of the questions and responses that we've heard this evening. Uh, so the um, new part five is as shown on the screen, the 12 month transition plan to come back to council by the October 2022 council meeting, including full details of the proposed communication plan, practical support initiatives and educational activities and associated resourcing requirements. And if I could put in an addition and advice from those councils that have already implemented 24-hour cat curfews. Thank you. And, and that picks up on um, Administrator Eddie's point. Uh, and just if you could... <laughs> Correct that and also just take out the apostrophe S on council. Advice from those councils, thank you. Uh, and then uh, six, request the CEO to write to his counterparts at all abutting municipalities, advising them of council's resolutions in relation to cat confinement and mandatory cat desexing and seeking to work cooperatively in relation to potential joint approaches. Do I have a seconder? Yes, you do. Thank you, Mr. Eddy. Uh, just in speaking to um, this particular item, I uh, just wanted to note that this is obviously another matter that we're considering this evening that's very complex and, again, it has, has required multiple briefings, document review and uh, discussions. And for me, uh, it would have been easier to deliberate if there was a greater degree of consistency across councils and obviously across municipal borders, as uh, Administrator Eddie has already highlighted in relation to those boundary issues. Uh, but nonetheless, the basis of my decision to support the officer recommendation, but with the um, additional recommendations, is threefold. Um, firstly, um, I support that safe cat, safe wildlife approach, and Ms Blandford referred to that, because for me, it's about weighing up the best approach for both cat welfare as well as for our uh, natural wildlife. And I've been really shocked to see the statistics and the growing rats, the growing rates of cat impoundment within the city of Whittlesea, which are much higher than many other municipalities. For me, that's of real concern. Uh, and the fact that we've got low rates of cats being reclaimed following impoundment and uh, an incredibly high euthanasia rate that was noted of 27%. So for me, a status quo approach clearly will not resolve this situation. And I think it's been highlighted and Ms Blandford further clarified it in relation to an earlier question 
that even a dusk to dawn curfew presents really huge practical issues for council officers in effective enforcement. Um, compulsory cap desexing with the appropriate subsidies for those on lower in incomes is clearly a complementary uh, approach. Uh, and I really believe that officers have summarised the benefits of the two approaches of cap confinement and mandatory cap desexing, namely together they'll hopefully reduce the number of unwanted litters of kittens, protect cats from harm, reduce the spread of feline diseases, decrease those nuisance complaints regarding cats and obviously and very importantly also protect our local wildlife. So I've moved the two additional recommendations because I feel it's imperative that we work with our colleagues, particularly where we have abutting municipal boundaries to look at um, complementary initiatives in that space. Hence the recommendation about the CO writing to his counterparts at all abutting uh, municipalities. And I'd also like to see that proposed transition plan as soon as possible and the associated resourcing requirements just to give us and community members maximum time to be able to work through implementation issues. Uh, so thank you for that. And uh, Administrator Eddie, would you like to also speak? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm actually a very strong supporter of this. What I have caution about is the, uh, the process and making sure we get that right and ensuring that we bring our community along with us because it won't work if the community doesn't understand and accept the need for it and uh, isn't on board with it. It's also really challenging to implement something when you have other councils doing different things, taking different approaches. Um, I'm comforted by the fact that, uh, for example, Bass Coast has recently gone down the path of a 24-hour cat curfew. They're also doing a 12-month transition, which is sensible to allow people to get ready for it. And it seems to have been largely positively received, which, uh, which as I say, is, is comforting. I'm comforted by the statistics that show about 80% of our residents support a curfew of some form. I am concerned that a significant number would have preferred a sunrise to sunset curfew and I think it's going to be really important and incumbent upon us to um, I guess explain to those people why that wasn't a workable option or isn't really um, a feasible option due to the the challenges that have been outlined for us um, this evening um, the practical support initiatives are obviously going to be uh, critical and crucial, and I would ask our officers to uh, to keep their, their their ears and eyes peeled for other things that are happening around uh, other councils that might be new and innovative and help us to move the needle on this issue, because we're not going down a path that no one else hasn't forged before and I think as a sector we should all be working uh, to learn from each other and make sure we don't repeat the mistakes that others have made. Uh, Freudian slip from Madam Chair about growing rats. I do <laughs> hope the result of this isn't uh, a growing rat population. I'll just leave that there and say I'm happy to uh, support this and there's a lot of work ahead for our officers and I wish them well and if there's anything we can do as a council to, uh, to support that along the way, obviously uh, be happy to look at that as well. Thank you, uh, Mr Eddy. Ms Duncan, any further comments? Uh, I will then put the item to a vote. All those in favour, the motion is carried. Thank you, Ms Blanford and Mr O'Mara. Uh, item 5.1, unconfirmed minutes of audit and risk committee meeting, and Mr Joyce, who is obviously our Executive Manager Governance and Strategy, could I hand over to you, please, for a brief introduction? Thank you, Chair. The Audit and Risk Committee meets at least four times per year and its charter requires that the minutes of the committee meeting are presented to Council. The Audit and Risk Committee considered a number of reports at the meeting held on the 26th of May 2022, including the Corporate Performance Report, a Risk Management Update Report, Internal Audit Reports on Grants, Management of Children's Crossings and the Administration of the Waste Service Charge. <clears throat> 
as well as the draft assets plan and asset management plan. The meeting was also the final meeting for independent member Theresa Glab, who was thanked for her participation and invaluable contributions to the committee during her years on the order of this committee. So I put forward the officer recommendation that council note the unconfirmed minutes of the audit and risk committee meeting held on the 26th of May, 2022. Thank you, Mr. Joyce. Do I have a mover for the officer recommendation for item 5.5.1? I'm happy to move that, Madam Chair. Thank you. And I'm happy to second the item. Did you wish to speak at all, Administrator Eddy? I think it speaks for itself, Madam Chair, just to uh, echo Mr Joyce's comments uh, of the thanks to Theresa Glab for her service on, on the committee and we wish her well in the future and uh, look forward to the contribution of the newer members that are coming through. Thank you, Mr Eddy. And I would just simply note that it was another huge um, agenda with some really important items. Uh, not least of which, obviously, the recognition of our departing independent member. Uh, I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Item 5.5.2, Governance Rules Review. And again, Mr Joyce, if I could invite you to provide an overview of this report. Thank you, Chair. The governance rules detail council decision-making processes, including how council meetings are conducted, how decisions are made and communicated, and how the election of mayor and deputy mayor are managed when we return to elected officials. A review of the rules has recently occurred, including considering recent changes to the Local Government Act, and also consultation with the Whittlesea Interfaith Network in relation to implementing a diversity statement. Among the proposed changes to the rules, which were last updated in 2021, are provisions for virtual and hybrid meetings, clearer definitions of meeting roles, embedding the acknowledgement of traditional owners and the introduction of a good governance diversity statement to open council meetings, um, replacing the Lord's Prayer, which is currently said. It has also been rewritten in simpler language to make it easier to understand. The proposed rules will increase community participation in council meetings by expanding public question time to enable statements to be read by community members in addition to asking a question. A four week community consultation process is being proposed and all members of the community can provide input into the rules through this process. Officers will also proactively seek further feedback from the Whittlesea Interfaith Network, the Youth Advisory Committee, the Disability Advisory Committee and the Whittlesea Multicultural Network. So I put forward the recommendation that Council 1 endorse the updated governance rules for community consultation from 25th July 2022 until 21st of August 2022, and to consider the feedback from the community consultation on the revised governance rules for adoption in September 2022. Thank you, Mr. Joyce. And uh, administrators, any questions of Mr. Joyce? No. no. Uh, I've got no questions either. Um, however, I'm happy to move the officer recommendation for item 5.5.2. And do I have a seconder? Happy to second, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Duncan. Uh, I'm really happy to move the officer recommendation for this item and I think Mr Joyce provided a really excellent overview of the key changes and provisions within these new draft governance rules that are going out on public exhibition. Clearly it's one year on from the adoption of the previous rules which were in June 2021 and we gave a commitment that we would really do that review to see how were the governance rules operating and whether there are any further refinements that we wanted to make. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight and echo Mr Joyce's comments that the new draft governance rules really, I believe, are contemporary and best practice. They're user friendly, they're plain English, and I think they're really easy to navigate. Uh, you recognise, Mr Joyce, a new provision of the Local Government Act regarding hybrid council meetings and Obviously, that, there, that's reflected in these new governance rules. But I think really importantly, the new governance rules embed our new community-focused approach. And 
uh, our genuine um, desire to engage with our community, including, and it's evident even tonight on, um, on with via the meeting that we've had online, the opportunity for residents to actually speak at council meetings and at our community-based community forums and council meetings. So that's to really be embedded in the new governance rules. Uh, and then you rightly indicated that the other main change was that um, we are proposing not only to include the formal acknowledgement of traditional owners, but also the potential replacement of the prayer with a diversity statement with reference to diverse cultures, faiths and beliefs. And that really does align with our broad uh, 2040 vision of a place for all. Uh, so now our um, draft rules, if endorsed this evening, will go out on public exhibition, as Mr Joyce said, till the 24th, 21st of August. Uh, and we really look forward to hearing community views uh, and the views of the targeted key stakeholder discussions that will occur. Uh, so um, do, does the seconder wish to speak to this item? Um, just to say, Chair, that I concur with everything you've said and to also congratulate council officers for writing um, the governance um, framework in and rules review in plain English. So well done because it's very quite it's very easy to understand. So congratulations. Mm. Thank you, Ms. Duncan. Uh, Mr. Eddy, any further comments? I'll then put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, and again, thank you for all the work on, on the governance rules, Mr Joyce. Uh, I note that there are no notices of motion. Uh, administrators, are there any items of urgent business? No? So if I could then move to reports of council representatives and also the CEO update uh, and invite firstly Administrator Duncan to provide a brief update to council and the community in relation to her activities over the past uh, less than month. Thank you, Chair. Administrator um, Duncan. Thank you. I'm not sure if I've missed the cutoff point here, but obviously I attended the community meeting prior to the last council meeting at the Barry, Barry Road Community Centre. So I just wanted to say thank you to everybody that made the effort to come out um, and visit with all of us and the council officers who were on site at night. And a very special thanks to the beautiful choir we had. Um, they were fantastic. Um, I've also been to Epping Views Family and Children's Centre in uh, Lindarum Drive in Epping for a visit there, uh, to Epping Memorial Hall as well, and then to the Epping Community Services Hub. And um, you and I were fortunate enough to be their chair when it was with their one year um, celebration of being uh, back in control of that hub. And we got to meet with not only our Whittlesea staff, but also the partners that work out of that um, building offering a sort of integrated service across the community when they need it. So everything under all of one roof and just uh, congratulations to everybody that has got that up and going um, and the services they're offering to the community. It's absolutely fantastic. And they should be really proud of what they've achieved. And I know there's, they're wanting to achieve more, but so far it was very impressive. That's it, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Duncan. Um, any questions, um, Administrator Eddie, of Ms. Duncan? No, Chair. And I also have no questions. Thank you. Uh, so if I could then hand over to Mr. Eddie to provide an update as well. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll be very brief. I did miss the last uh, council meeting due to illness. So I'm assuming, Chair, that you spoke about our attendance at the National General Assembly in Canberra, which uh, has certainly been um, 
a, a well worthwhile uh, experience for me. We got to meet the new Federal Minister for Local Government, Christy McBain, and I know uh, you, Madam Chair, and the CEO uh, managed to take in some other important meetings as well. Since that time, uh, it's been a little bit quieter than usual, but we've had a couple of uh, significant events, uh, Coffee with Council, uh, as was mentioned at Doreen last week, and uh, they kept us busy, Madam Chair. I know you weren't able to join us, but we had a, a steady stream of, of locals with uh, their uh, their concerns, their issues, and, and not all concerns and issues, also some positive feedback too about the work the Council's been doing in that area. Uh, so it was great to meet those people and uh, hear the things that are on their mind. And uh, I had the opportunity to uh, sub for you at the citizenship ceremony last Tuesday evening with 130 new uh, citizens uh, inducted there, which was a, always a great experience and it was a pleasure uh, to do that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and thank you to both of you for uh, attending a number of things in my place over the past uh, three plus weeks. Um, Ms Duncan, do you have any questions of uh, Mr Eddy? No, Chair. No, and I, I also have no questions, thank you. Uh, so if I could then perhaps just make a, um, a, a few comments in relation to some of my activities. Uh, I've had a Yarra Plenty Regional Library Corporation CEO Employment Matters Subcommittee uh, and also attended, uh, and in fact, I'm the Chair of the Finance Audit and Risk Subcommittee of Whittlesea Community Connections. Uh, important to note that I did uh, an ABC radio interview with Waleed Ali uh, a couple of weeks ago, and that was during the segment Meet Your Mayor. And obviously, in this case, it was meet your administrator. Uh, and that was a really positive thing. And we did actually have a number of residents who called in to that interview. So I was really pleased about that. Uh, Ms Duncan already talked about some of our really important site visits at the end of uh, last month. And it was really great to visit a number of community organisations and see some of a couple of the beautiful murals uh, I also had the great privilege of being part of the NAIDOC week um, celebrations uh, that were hosted at council alongside our CEO, who was the MC on the day, and a, a whole range of uh, dignitaries. Uh, and then I participated with a, a Super Saturday citizenship um, where we had three sessions and over 400 people became new Australian citizens. And as always, it's an enormous privilege to be officiating ceremonies. Uh, I'm happy to respond to any questions if there are any. Oh, Mr. D Mr. Eddy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Your interview with Waleed Ali, did you receive some curly questions from the residents on that program? <laughs> Um, I'm not so sure that they were, I did receive a number of questions and they were, um, uh, but I didn't necessarily find them particularly difficult or curly. Um, I did really uh, understand the subject matter and one of them, in fact, was on a major advocacy program that we um, are really pushing forward uh, in relation to the grassy eucalypt woodland. So. Um, we've got some very passionate residents who live in Whittlesea and um, I thought it was a great opportunity to have that direct interaction. So I think uh, Waleed Ali was also very interested in the concept of administrators as opposed to council. So I had the opportunity to again confirm that we have the full roles and responsibilities of the council just like other councillors. Well, I have heard the reviews have been largely positive, in fact, extremely positive, Madam Chair. So there could be a radio career. Oh, like, thank you. After thank you. Career. Thank you, Mr. Eddy. <laughs> uh, could I then ask the CEO to provide an update to both um, the community and council in relation to his activities or key issues over the past period? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm going to focus on uh, the current COVID situation a little mm. bit tonight as it um, is a, a, obviously an escalating issue at the moment. So we've seen a significant increase in case numbers and the modelling from the state government and the advice from the Chief Health Officer is a, an expected 
significant increase further over the next four to five weeks. Um, we're sitting on the fourth position on the league table, as I like to describe it, in the number of current active cases for the state currently. Um, but there's some other figures I wanted to share with you this evening that uh, I think just put into the context the situation that the city of Whittlesea faces itself. <laughs> so we, we have the second lowest third vaccine rate um, in the state. We're sitting at only 64% of take up of the third vaccine uh, in the state. And we have the highest hospital hospitalisation rate uh, in, of all the northern councils. But probably the most worrying uh, figure of all of these is we have the third highest death rate of any municipality in Victoria. And that's probably a com combination of our demographics, uh, population, but also that low take up of, of vaccines, unfortunately. The state government is leading a, a fresh drive for people to uh, get vac vaccinated. And, and uh, you may well be aware that the fourth vaccine is now available for uh, it's encouraged, strongly encouraged for everyone over 50, but is also available to everyone over 30. Uh, and, that, and in some cases, Indigenous uh, people and younger people with um, particular medical conditions. So we're encouraging people to, uh, to take up those, uh, those vaccines where they're eligible. We're also encouraging our community to wear masks. Again, we're being strongly encouraged to wear masks in settings uh, where it's not possible to keep that 1.5 metre distance or if you're working in close proximity to people, if you're out shopping, those kind of things. Uh, that's what will keep the case numbers under um, some level of control here. The whole reason behind all of this, I think, is it's important for us to reflect on is that our health services are under some considerable strain at the moment. And we're hearing from our partners, both the Northern Hospital, DPV Health and others, that they're under significant pressure. So we've all got a moral obligation to, to make sure that we're supporting each other and helping those, those health agencies wherever we can. And it was pleasing to see the Premier and the Minister for Health out today at the Northern Health, uh, at the Epping facility, uh, announcing an expansion of the virtual ED program, which was a statewide first. Uh, online, of course, and it means that you can access um, doctors, nurses in an ED setting to provide you frontline medical advice of whether you need to attend in person an ED or whether you're better off attending your GP or take some other course of action. So the government's announced an expansion of that. They're currently dealing with about 300 patients a day. So that's a significant number of people that would probably otherwise have turned up to an ED department, uh, which is already very busy. So big shout out to the Northern Health for coming up with that initiative. It's a statewide first uh, and it's now being taken up more broadly. So that's, a, that's really, uh, really important. On a much lighter note and talking about new uh, initiatives, I just had word uh, from uh, Sydney that in the Australian Reporting Awards, which are being held tonight, uh, the City of Whittlesea has been awarded a silver award uh, for our 21-22 annual report. Um, it's the first time that Council has entered uh, into this competition uh, and we put up last year. So that looks at the quality of the documentation, how readable it is for our community and readers of the document, the presentation style, uh, and the, particularly things like the way that the financials are presented uh, and how that people can understand uh, what they mean. So we're very proud of receiving the, the silver award uh, and we'll be um, taking some feedback to see how we can try and get that to a gold award next year and, and make our, our reporting even better. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Lloyd. And if you could also extend our sincere congratulations to our, our communications team on achieving that silver award for the annual report. Uh, and very concerning in relation to the statistics that you've just run through. Um, any uh, questions of Mr. Lloyd? Uh, yes, Chair. Um, Mr. Lloyd, you've said that we've got one of the lowest vaccine rates. Can you just, if you know the answer, obviously, I think you do. Could you please tell me, is that for having three jabs or just back to one jab? Yeah, thank you, uh, Administrator Duncan. So, look, our figures are still very low for uh, people that have not been vaccinated at all. Right. Um, so we, we're pretty much at, right near the bottom of, the, of that table for people with no vaccines, 
people with first vaccine, second vaccine and the third vaccine. Okay, thank you. And I've just a follow up question is, um, obviously, Northern Health have, have, have done this new initiative and those sorts of things. Do we have a plan as, as the council to try to drive vaccination again? Mm -hmm. You know, we did it really well during the height of the pandemic, and I guess it's still heightened pandemic, but in a different way. Um, do we have a plan of how we might be able to reach those people or educate them about them, you know, it's for their own health and to take the strain off the um, medical system that they should get vaccined, vaccinated, sorry. Yeah, thank you, Administrator, for the question. Yes, um, yes, we do. So we're, we're continuing to assist of health in particular with the messaging. So we're pushing those out on our social media. Our community-based staff are working with community groups, again, to continue to encourage them, but also to take feedback from those groups of why they're not taking up the vaccines, how do we make it more accessible and passing those on uh, to the Department of Health and the Department of Families as well. Um, I think it's probably um, also important to note that at this point that council officers uh, led by Ms Wood, who you all saw earlier on, uh, are revisiting our own business continuity plans because if the case numbers continue as planned, we may well see uh, increased um, non-attendance of our staff who are either sick or isolating, uh, and that may have some impact on our services as it has done before. So that that, uh, that works well underway, and, and I'm feeling very confident that uh, we've got very solid plans in place. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think the only comment I'll make to that is obviously we know with this uh, strain that uh, you can have 28 days of non-negative, non non-positive as for COVID, even though you've had it, but within 28 days, potentially, you could get infected again. Um, so I think that it does come up in the air a bit of our... Um, workforce planning and those things. So I think that's a great, great to hear about the BCP um, being have, had another look at. So that's great. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Duncan. And I had a similar thought just even about the council promotional role in relation to that wonderful initiative, um, Mr Lloyd, for the emergency department program at Northern Health. It's a great initiative. Uh, thank you for your report, and just to note that our reports will be included within the minutes of the council meeting. Uh, administrators, I require now a motion to close the meeting to the public under section 66-2A of the Local Government Act 2020 for consideration of confidential items. Uh, it's item number 9.5.1. Contracts 2020-2, Facilities Variation Contract Update. Do I have a mover to close the meeting for consideration of confidential items? Happy to move closing of the meeting, Chair. Seconded. Sorry, I, I actually will need to just go back uh, because, oh, no, no, sorry. So uh, Administrator Duncan's moved it and Administrator Eddy has seconded. I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour? Uh, the motion is carried. And that brings us to the end of the open meeting and therefore I declare the open meeting closed. Thank you all.